All right, guys, so it's uh, the Meta Goblin here. Today I am joined by BPK, a former World of Warcraft Game Master. We're going to be doing a very, very uh, long interview covering a number of topics. Uh, first of all, we have a little bit of an introduction. Secondly, we're going to talk about everything there is to know and all the questions that people ha have about botting. Uh, we'll talk about gold selling, hackers, scammers. We'll talk a lot about some Blizzard drama, a whole topic dedicated to that. And then we have a section of many burning questions that people have always wanted to ask a former uh, game master. And then we'll have some like last minute questions, um, you know, some that we've picked up from the uh, YouTube community post. So let's dive in. Um, so let's start with a little bit of an introduction. So um, perhaps you could tell us, um, you know, what was your full role at Blizzard um, and how long did you work there for? <laughs> Too long. That's wow. If I'm thinking about it, I've been there for more than a quarter of my life. At, wow. Wow, that's, it's bad to ask such questions. <laughs> Getting <laughs> reminiscent about that. But yeah, um, I started out as a GM in like 2009. It was, it was the just shortly after the launch of Wrath of the Lich King expansion. And then I worked there until we all got fired. Not too long ago. Yeah. So, so we're, we're, yeah, it leads on to our and I've second been, question. Um, you know, why, why, why do you know, perhaps you can explain the situation as to obviously why you do not lo longer work for Blizzard. Yeah, the the office was just closed, um, citing economical issues, and um, mo most of the employees were in this PSE. It's like a structure for trying to get everybody uh, a job back, and it's uh, done by by the French government in a way. Um, so yeah, that was the end of an era. Yeah, so where, whereabouts was the office? Uh, that one's... So I, I worked in Versailles, which is, or Velizy Versailles. It's, uh, the, the offices were moving. And you, you can still even find some pictures online where you, you see uh, the cool Blizzard sign outside and, uh, yeah, just some GMs walking around. Everybody, everybody knew the people. Lots of, lots of GMs walking around with... Uh, the Blizzard merch and the Blizzard jackets and everything. Yeah, yeah you have sent me some screenshots, which uh, hopefully should be uh, on the screen right now in the video. So um, what kind of hours does a, a game master work? Do, do GMs um, have to do night shifts, for instance? Well, it depends because that changed that changed a lot over time. I mean, it's it's like a normal office job. You, you just come in and... Um, you, you work your eight hours a day, but later on it was changed to 10 hours. Uh, that was very convenient. I liked that a lot, where you had just four days of work and three days of weekend, which was very cool. Uh, freed up your time. Some people liked it, some, some people didn't, but I personally enjoyed it. Uh, and the shift system, they tried to cover like a lot of time in the beginning, but then it's just like a normal office job where you come in Eight, work you eight hours and that's it and there are like different starting times 8 10 12 a night shift was there in the early early days but that one was removed after a while i don't remember when that was probably like 2013 2014 or something yeah it was a really pain but then it's much easier you know in a, in a giant global company it's much easier to deal with night shifts and so on if you just let the other side of the earth cover it for the night shift. So mm -hmm. you don't you don't necessarily have to have your employees do all the work in the night and then break your rhythm or people that have kids, children and so on. It's it's really a struggle to be in the night shift, even though some people really like the night shift. It's it's easier to cover it if if somebody else on the other side who is actually awake is doing the job. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what, how how would you uh, evaluate like the quality of life uh, overall? You know, working as a WoW GM, um, you know, 
Was there any like health insurance benefits? Uh, you know, how good was the salary? You know, stuff like that. Uh, so I can only speak for myself because I don't know how it is in, in other regions or so and so on. Um, we were we were covered pretty good because most of it in in France is dealt with by the government. So you have to have you have you have lots of protections. Um, you do have like the the coverage for for tea for for health insurance and everything. Um, I started out at like minimum minimum wage, minimum base wage or whatever that is. And back in the super early days, it was like. What was it? 20, 23, 24k or something that that I started out with. Yeah, yeah. Um, how how many like GMs was uh like per region? You know, per EU, uh, US. Um, I think it's like six hundred where I work. But I mean, you can you can easily double check the numbers by going to the credits and see how many GMs. Where I were listed, uh, in in the credits, yeah, it was a Is lot. I couldn't even count. I I couldn't even count the people, but it feels like five hundred, six hundred or so. Is, and then it dwindled over like time decline? because people people weren't hired anymore. Yeah. yeah. Did that number decline over time? Uh yeah yeah the um, I mean the the hiring processes they were only in in Cork after a while so. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was I was probably one of I what no not not probably but I think I was one of the last GMs that uh, was hired in Valisi or Versailles. I don't maybe like one or two came after me or something, but yeah, I remember I had the choice between going to Cork and uh, going to Valisi, and I just I just took France because I wanted something new and the weather was probably better than than in Cork. Yeah. Um. Mm. So, like, how does one actually become a GM? You know, what qualifications do you need? Do you need a degree or anything like that? You don't need anything. You just need to be passionate, uh, friendly, um, able to deal with um, the necessities of customer support. Because at the end of the day, it is just working with people, be having emotional intelligence, being able <clears throat> to do technical support if, if you're into that field. And uh, as knowledgeable as possible, I guess. And it's it, back in the day that was like my dream job. I I actually couldn't even imagine that uh, I I got it because I sent out my CV and then I only got the response after like two or three months. I was like, oh, I completely forgot about this. Yeah, and um, the way I structured my CV back then was also like pondering on the quality and at this point in time I didn't even know about Blizzard core values but luckily quality and um, and the technical savvy that I had was a big plus apparently so yeah I mean now with my knowledge I would say know the company uh, try uh, try to get as much knowledge as you can about about the job if you really want to do that in general, even um, get some kind of contact that you can talk to and find out more about the the post that you're interested in, and then go for it and try to to be the best candidate. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get to the meat and potatoes now. The uh, the big questions. Um, let's, you know, let's touch on like bots and stuff like that. So. You know what? What kind of what is the main job and responsibility for a GM? You know what? What are a game masters' priorities, like their day to day, you know, life? Answering tickets. So the the main reason, no, the, the main existence for a game master is to be a ticket machine, like to answer all the requests in in a in as little time as possible. That's the feeling I always had. And you're, uh, you're doing like, I don't know, seven, 10, 12, 14 tickets per hour. The more you can get, the better. Like depending on how much you can do. 
Um, and then there is different tasks you can you can go into. You can do phone, you can do web chat, you can do just normal ticket replies, and then special tasks and so on. There are all different kinds of ways to to do your job. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. There isn't actually like a like a dedicated um, like subgroup of game masters who uh, specialize in you know going onto the game servers, finding bots, detecting them, and banning them. There's there's none of that, is there? Well, there, there is some kind. The there is the the like risk risk team and what is it called? There are some analysts that are specified for that, but they're doing it for all games, and they they do they do basically everything. So it's like from StarCraft, and you, as a, as a game master, you work for all games anyway. So um, the there are a few special people that are dealing only with fraud, risk, security. Uh, I don't know payment payment issues uh, where. Uh, stolen credit cards or something are used. You you have that, yeah. Right, but it's mainly specializing in like issues like credit card f- but, fraud. But those are not game masters. Yeah, but th- right, those are yeah. not game masters. So they won't be going into the game trying to find bots or anything. Mm, I don't know. Probably not. I would assume, because that's that's dealing on a like larger scale. I mean, even game masters only rarely go in game. There is really no reason to reason for it to go in game. Like the yeah. the the um, if you if you do a verification based on based on visuals, you can only do one, and it goes against your efficiency in doing tickets. So it's 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 not really something you want to do as a game master, right? So the priority is mainly responding to tickets. So, I mean, what steps do um, you know game masters or obviously the risk team use to detect bots um, and hackers? And well, actually, let's focus on bots now. Like, what 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 methods do they use to actually detect bots? Can can you can you come again? Yeah, no. No worries. Uh, so, what what steps does the risk team and and game masters what what do they what do they do to try and detect and find bots? Wow, that's an open question. Uh, I hope everything they can do. <laughs> um, so, there is obviously the warden system that everybody knows that is trying to to catch things, um, but most of this stuff is giant spreadsheets and data-driven analysis so that's why they're analysts if, if you're if you are a risk analyst you you try to ban as many accounts as possible and those are the ban waves that everybody knows so you're you're going off of uh, big numbers and special what, how can you call that um special metrics that are identifying the patterns or whatever a bot is using, maybe maybe email, maybe name, maybe the login data and so on. So all those kinds of things and then mass bandwaves happen. Right. Um, you know, in your experience of uh, being a game master, you know, what kind of bots have you found in the game? I mean, do you have any like interesting like horror stories? Or you could share with us. Flying bots are the most annoying, I would say, because some sometimes you see them swooping around, or when you slash who, you you can see see them even as a player. Um, but yeah, so the, there are like the the flying flying ones in dungeons that are just farming. There are the pickpocket bots. There are the the normal farm bots outside. Yeah, the lotus gathering bots. Um, it's it's part of like classic uh, black lotus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are the the bots that are just mass farming. Maybe you've seen it in retail, or like an owl or decays that are just 30, 50 running around in in a circle on one hyper spawn, and then 
They just kill everything and mass pull everything around uh, in their vicinity. Um, what else is there? The node farming bots that are just stealing all the herbs and all the mining nodes. Yeah, those are the ones that I can think of right now. We touched on um, the uh, the warden system just before. Could, what could you tell us about how the war, you know the Blizzard warden system actually works? Because there's a lot of theories about it, um, but no one really knows how it actually works. Hmm. Yeah. So from from what I understand, it's it's basically scanning your hard drive. So the and I know this actually only from hackers and from uh, from other sources, uh, not because I'm a GM. Um, they they load some kind of software, checking checking what you're doing in the background, and then if the software detects some kind of program that is interjecting code into the RAM or into the the game files, then it detects that. And then sends the data back to. It's an anti cheat system. I mean, it's just detecting whatever is interacting with the with the WoW client. Yeah, checks everything in the background, and then, uh, yeah, hopefully you're banned if yeah. you're using any malicious software. But from so, what I understand, it's not on. very effective because apparently it doesn't do a lot, unfortunately. And yeah, we, that might be because of the EU regulations. Uh, yeah. yeah, we will have a specialist episode that will talk more about you know topics like that in the future. Because um, for people that don't know, we, we do have a little Discord collaboration going on. Um, about, you know, BBK, BBK is on and a number of ha uh, professional, crazy, big brain hackers, uh, GDKP owners. Basically, yeah, everyone is in this Discord and we do... Uh, collaborate and talk a lot and that's basically what's uh you know providing the research and information for these videos um the last topic you know everyone has this like a uh, crackpot theory that blizzard actually allow bots to exist because they can actually make money from those bots you know from from scripture money and from people buying the game what could you tell us about that? Could you, well, I already know that it's uh, because we've talked, um, we have a, another, another thing I should mention is we have had a few kind of uh, mock interviews to set up this interview, set up the questions and everything. Um, but yeah, could could you like diffuse that crackpot theory that everyone believes? Yeah, so that, that can be fell from the truth. I, I read that a lot on, on the forums and on, on Reddit and so on, but it's, it's really just a, negative for Blizzard. Any bot that is in the game, they're, they're basically using fraud, fraudulent money, fun tokens. They use stolen credit cards to, to buy the, orig the original seed uh, game time. Or they already have gold somewhere from previous uh, things that, that they hacked, that they uh, stolen, whatever. And then they buy the game time with that. So it's yeah. it's not like they are introducing new uh, economical mass into the system. And then they are visible to the players. They are annoying the players. They are destroying the economy. It's all just minuses. Um, and people think that the hackers actually buy normal game time or buy a World of Warcraft expansion or something. But they never do that. They never pay. They, they pay zero. And it's just a, just a big mess. It's uh, only down, uh, only negatives for, for Blizzard. And there is like thousands of them, uh, thousands of credit cards that, that you can just buy online for a few bucks and then all load them all up. There's just stolen credit card details. Load them up and buy whatever you want online, basically. And then the credit card companies, they charge back that money uh, and that's also an issue because any chargeback, if you, if you ever worked as a uh, in a store or you own a business or something, you know that you are actually also given costs for chargebacks because you didn't check everything or 
uh, you allowed the transaction without verifying someone's identity and so on. So it's it's only minuses. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing you could say is that it's somehow with the WoW token gives extra revenue because some people buy the the WoW token gold, but uh, that's like a big stretch. I'm I'm thinking any bot, any purchase, any game time that is used by a bot or a hacker, it's it's all fraudulent. Yeah. Yeah. And big minus. Let's move on to the topic of um, infamous gold selling. You know, what steps do Blizzard actually take to um, detect gold sellers and uh, get them banned? Not enough. <laughs> Currently, I wish. Yeah, I wish there would be more. Like you, you, you can always do more, but it, it's also it costs a lot. You know, if you if you have GMs that do this manually, it's not really effective. You have to you have to hire a lot of people. So you, you'd have to go through the logs, you have to find the people, um, you have to deal with IPs and different accounts and fake accounts and all that stuff. And then um, what you can do is you can find the gold and the gold sellers, you know where they are, They're based on the massive amounts of gold transfers. But there's also the problem that you have to deal with gold washing and all the like smart gold sellers they um, they transfer the gold or they only hack an account just for that certain amount of time to to get access to it and then they immediately trade it to the person who buys it and then it's really hard to to like remove it uh, from the from the person who bought it or from from the wow token because that is like a fully automated system and you just put in gold and you get automatically the reward and game time back and then you have to redo re- put back all this process back it's like ah yeah is it true that the the whole guild bank laundering laundering method makes it harder for people or blizzard to detect um gold sellers yeah i would say definitely yeah it's uh, the the system is like from 2000 to the, like everything. I mean, probably they improved over time in the background or something um, because I'm, I'm not an engineer, but everything that WoW was built on is like from the early 2000s. And guild banks are also not not that old. They have what, from when did guild banks got introduced? In like 2008, 2007? Yeah, TBC. So that's like an Middle ancient, TBC, I think. yeah. It's like an archaic ancient system and everything was just patched on later on with any any system that came additionally. So it's really hard to deal with. And um, it's also a trade-off between convenience for the player and then how do you how do you deal with it against bots? Because you could say we will never allow putting gold in a gold bank that would like immediately remove any issues with gold washing. But then you don't have the convenience for the players to have a pooled amount in in gold. Right. But just because the guild bank allows multiple, multiple owners, and then you can take, uh, put gold in or put gold out that immediately makes, makes it washable. And then multiple people can, can have access to that gold and just, Tip it wherever you want it, or trade it. Even if one of the accounts get gets banned, then just another account can take out the gold and transfer it to the next guild bank and the next guild bank and the next guild bank. Basically, it's like cat and mouse game. And every time you do something with a bot or something uh, with hunting hackers, you you have this constant war between the developers trying to to create anti measures. And then the hackers trying to find a new exploit, a new thing. So it's it's a constant tuck and tuck and back and forth between the developers and the hackers. Yeah, that, I mean, obviously the hackers are Blizzard. Blizzard is correct in saying that the hackers are pretty much just as smart uh, and just as powerful. But like, would, would you say that overall maybe even smarter because they're always yeah, coming maybe. up with like really crazy stuff? <laughs> Would you say that overall the infrastructure that Blizzard has to detect everything like this is is lacking and it could be better? Uh, 
definitely. Well, everything could be better. Like better logs, better, more people to deal with. Uh, like the, if, if it was me, I would just hire a bunch of people uh, and just deal only with, with risk most more. Like, yeah, like a yeah. more hands-on approach. But, but then I, I can see why Blizzard doesn't want to do it because it just costs a lot of money and then you're not providing really value to the company. You'd have to have so many more. I, I went through this in, in my head. If you just have like 20 people that you hire to just fight bots in the game and don't do anything else, like you're not doing analyst stuff, you're not doing anything for another game. If you only do it for World of Warcraft and you, buy, and you, you get 20 people to do this work, it will cost you like a million if you pay them 50, 50k per year. And that's not a good yeah. pay, actually. I mean, you, 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 ideally, you want to pay someone like this um, so he doesn't do any bad shit and it's, it's, um, it's a long-term job and people can, can get really engulfed in the work and not have to worry about their, their normal life or whatever. And so there is also no risk of them becoming a hacker or trying to, to sell their knowledge or something. Yeah, that's um, true. They they need to be higher paid jobs. So I I would personally I'm I'm not sure how this works in in the business world, but I would think that some 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 company would pay a risk analyst like a hundred k or one hundred fifty k maybe, and then that ramps up the price immediately if you just hire twenty people just to get rid of everything, and then you need to balance that out with um with subscriptions and you need like 6,500 people that subscribe for one year or like 10,000 people for one year just to pay the salary of, of this and of yeah. these 20 people. So it's, it's like in a business sense, it's a, it's a loss and I understand why they don't do it, but it's mm. really shitty because in an ideal world, you would want that you, you want the game to have the highest uh, what's the word? Integrity, I guess. You you yeah, would quality. want the highest integrity for your game and fight fight a really good fight against the hackers because they are any every time there's just one system coming out, they're trying to find an exploit for that, and it's just really sad. But this is this is the world we live in. You have to fight the the chaos off, basically. Yeah. So um, moving on. What can you tell us about um, the practice of taking over someone else's account and account stealing and stuff like that? Oh, that's such a shit show. Uh, everybody, use an authenticator and use good passwords. <laughs> don't <laughs> execute any passwords. kind of viruses. Don't visit, don't, don't visit weird websites. And whenever somebody is whispering you in game and says he's a game master, he's not a game master. It's just fake phishing attempts to try to get you to log onto a fake website. And there are so many people that fall for this shit every, everywhere. Not, not just in, uh, in WoW, by the way, but in general scams, like in people replying to mails, re people replying to calls and so on. It's really an epidemic because the people, they, they have this initial fear reflex of like, oh, my account is getting banned if I don't visit that website or something. Or, oh, the GM is telling me to do something. But it's just a fake phishing link. And a lot of people, they, they lose their account to, to this silly stuff. And the, the hackers, they just lock in. They rinse the account with gold as much as possible. Everything that's on it, they, you sell, they, they sell your stuff, they, um, your, your, your items, they transfer the gold away. And then sometimes they even give it straight to the, to the next seller, which is kind of ridiculous. Sorry, did I answer the question because I got, uh, I got off on the tangent? Because we, we were talking about this a little bit last night, weren't we, about... Um like people changing their name and using fake IDs to take full control over someone else's account. Oh no, that's that's more that's more for account sharing and account selling. So because um, when when you see sometimes the websites that sell pre-made accounts, 
they they level up or hack up or bot up uh, on a character and then nowadays you don't need that anymore really because you have the boost token um but people are still trying to sell a fully docked out account or maybe a fully max level account because the boost token only give, gets you so far and those are linked to your name so in if if people were reading the uh the user agreement they would see that a blizzard account is always tied to your name that you chose so you always can get it back and when when hackers try to create those new accounts they just set it up with like fake names like michael jackson or some some silly stuff and then um if you buy the account they urge you to change the name so that it's really yours and uh uh you want it to to be on on your name uh, like peter willy or or whatever instead of michael jackson yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so and and then you you would contact the customer support and say hey i i got like a fake name here what's going on uh to to make your account registered in your name yeah but yeah there are there are some ways uh, to deal with that in the sense that you don't necessarily have to do it um as activision because you can just um try to figure out who is the original creator of the account and then uh not allow the name change and then ideally ban the person so because that's that's like a contested stolen account uh, hacked maybe sometimes even or or botted and then it shouldn't be playing anyway it's all it's all about integrity again like do you, do you want to allow this kind of side sell as a company i don't i don't think this should be happening no. yeah so the last question really about gold selling is like, um, why are buyers, people who buy the gold, why are they uh, barely ever banned? Like, how do you detect someone who's bought gold um, on a third party website? Mm, how would you detect that? Um, I mean, game masters don't really do that. They don't detect anything. Like if somebody if somebody reports that uh, you you bought gold, like how are you gonna how are you gonna check that up? Uh, you third, third party reports are really hard because everybody can lie, and then investigations take a long time to follow up on that. Um, I mean, you could see where the gold is coming from if it's directly straight from hacks and. Uh, if you wanted to take the time, you could go in and delete after you, after you've done the hack investigation, and then you could try to recover the gold. But that's extra time, so you're not really incentivized to go in and do manual integrity work. Rather, it's it's rather big actions, mass actions that are dealing with uh, hacks and bots accounts and gold removal and so on. So, um, uh, how would you, you, you would do it for fun, I guess. If you, if you're really <laughs> in, in high, yeah. Like if you have the time and you just, uh, you, you got your tickets per hour done and you, you want to. To have some additional work, I would say you could follow up the gold trail through like seven, eight, ten accounts or whatever, and try to find where it came from. Sometimes it's just one account, um, and then delete the gold. But then you also have to also have to deal with the customer that bought the gold, and then he's gonna create a ticket probably, and then complain that the gold was deleted from him. So mm. that's a negative for for Activision as well. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as I understand it, the the gold sellers are creating a very long like paper trail. So it requires more working time for a GM to detect the source of the gold and get that person banned. So basically, GMs don't have the time to do it. 
and that's why they only get picked up in these big band waves, which have been detected by the analyst teams by looking at metrics. Yeah, and the tools are really like the GMs are there to answer tickets at the end of the day, to give the support to the customer. It's not to to give out justice or integrity for, for the game in general. Like it's 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 just cumbersome to to deal with the tools and follow up on everything. Because basically there is thousands and thousands of codes and lines every every time that you have uh, in the logs when there is events or for the full day or for the full server. Like you really need to know what you're doing and what you're looking at. Like not even everybody uh, is able to to read all the code, all the logs. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think a lot of people will probably be um, quite surprised to hear that there is less, much less of a hands-on approach than um, than people think. Because when you know when issues like this happen, people are always saying, "Oh, what are the game masters doing? Oh, we need more game masters, this and that." But um, you know, it kind of sounds like that. You know, it's not a game master's highest priority. They have to focus on doing tickets. So it seems like, uh, yeah, more, a more drastic change is needed, really. Um, but anyway, we could uh, move on to the next topic, which is about um, hackers and scammers. The audio is about 36 minutes, so we'll stop and start it. So let, let's talk about, like, hackers and, uh, you know, the field of scammers as well. So... How are hackers actually detected by by Blizzard, by game masters? You know, speed hackers, underground, out of bounds, fly hacking. You know, what on earth is going on with that? Well, <clears throat> well, you have the right click report, and some people do report uh, straight through a ticket. I mean, so there there are rare occasions when bots are visible in the game. And most bots and, and hackers, they try to hide their tracks. They try not to be uh, visible to players. So they go into instances, they fly under the earth, they fly high up in the sky, they, uh, they are in raids or something. You know, then when next, next Ramas, Blackrock Mountain, uh, Zul Group, um, um, all the dungeons really. Uh, what is what is that one? Botanica is a big one that's used for farming. Yeah, yeah. There's always always some kind of bots uh, running around decays or something that can just endlessly farm that. And uh, the right click report is not really useful for those because they're just hiding for the players. So it would be somebody have somebody would have to use slash who of, or something try to report all of the 50 or 100 bots or whatever that which are running in the instance and have a mass action be designed for that specific thing. So I guess it helps a little bit, but the risk analysts, they should be doing this anyway and find all the metrics that they are like, what are they killing? It, are they all the same names? Is it like random gibberish names? Uh, is it all the same or similar email that the account was created uh, on and so on? So they have all these all these data that they can look at and uh, try to ban those accounts. But usually players or, or GMs, they don't get to, to work on this anyway. But uh, am I right by saying that there isn't some kind of like auto detection system, um, you know, server side? to well just just to know when someone's fly or speed hacking which is why some people can get away with it for so long oh i don't think there is um so <laughs> i've actually seen it on some private servers that have um speed hacking detection because you can see how how fast somebody is changing their their z-axis their x-axis their y-axis um but i don't think that exists in the game or at least not to my knowledge um, it would also be very detrimental to banning somebody based on that without having manually verified in game. And you don't want the GM to verify it in game because that's taking away from answering tickets as well. Yeah. So you 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 ban if you're banning somebody just based on data, 
you have to make sure that it's really, really good data and that there is no false positives. So the the margin, because the margin of error is so small, you also get a smaller result in, in the bands. If you widen the net, you would also be able to catch some players. Like, the, for example, with the dragon flying now, uh, that's a really fast coordinate change. So that would probably yeah. trigger any system that, that also would catch somebody who is speed hacking. Right? You need, you need, um, you would need to implement some kind of system that detects people under the, the earth. And from what I understand, um, there is a system, but it only catches if you're super, super low, be below, um, below the, like general world or something yeah, yeah or in the oceans or some kind or if you go to the gm island and so on that's 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 being that's being detected because that's outside of the bounds of the normal game but that's also like super super far away you can only get there with with hacks and uh tools and changing the game files and so on so if, if somebody would go there uh with a with a speed hack it would look the same as somebody who's dragon flying, and that's that's the crux of the issue. Right, but well, what about in classic though, where there is no dragon flying? Yeah, that would probably be better. Ah, but but even in classic, you got that. Do you, do you know the the quest line for for the Onyxia, where you get booted from one side of the continent to the other? Oh uh, yeah. That would also like like everybody's going for that, so that would be detected as uh, speed hacking because you're flying so fast, so fast through the air. Yeah. Or any time where an you fall off a though. mount or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. I mean, there is uh, always ways to do that. It's just about probably economical reasons for why you wouldn't do that because you need engineers, you need somebody who knows the old archaical code on how to deal with the scripts. I mean, most of the people that initially worked on WoW or created all those, uh, all those systems, all all the all the files in the background, like they they're all gone. Like probably just a few people are still working uh, that were there from the start and know really everything in and out. Every time you change such a giant system, you need intricate knowledge of it, and you need to probably study WoW for like half a year just to get ca caught up on all the uh, spaghetti code that's in there. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I've never worked on engineering or on the code or anything, but I would assume it's a, it's a pretty big mess. And when they, uh, uh, when they try to port the old classic database into the new Legion client, they also had a lot to fix because they had to connect all the databases with Battle.net and then they had to adapt a lot of stuff just to make it work because all the assets were changed. But I mean, it's crazy good that this happened because now we got WoW Classic back and it's it's amazing because that's my most favorite game. I've, I've literally never played any other game. Like, it's it has been great to, to play Classic again. Got my... And I got to do stuff that I never got to do. Like getting getting... Thunder Fury again, getting Scarab Lord, so many fun things, doing dungeons and raids that I've never done before. Yeah. It is actually a, it has just reminded me of Lord of Rings Online, that is a big problem because obviously that changed developer um, a few years ago, so it's actually a re really big the problem whole studio? Lord of Rings Online. Yeah, the whole studio changed to wow. change company. So Lord of Rings Online has a lot of lag issues and server crash issues because people don't know like fully you know the original code um and everything like that but anyway um yeah so how do you deal probably. go on yeah pro probably um because of like co coding I'm, I'm not a coder but from what i understand it's really hard if you don't know the whole system and you want to to change like one thing here it just breaks 10 other things if you don't know what the what the original thing was connected to that's the issue. And then you got like bugs and bugs coming out. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's difficult. Really, really expensive to hire 
engineers to totally recode everything from scratch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting. And also, topic. if if you hire them, do you really want somebody who just wants to come in for like a year? Like, if if you hire someone just to fix the issue, do you want to train and get them up to speed for like half a year to to work for a year? And then fire them again. That's also shitty. Like nobody really would want to do that kind of work, I would assume. Yeah. yeah. So how do you deal as a GM? This is something that I definitely know what GMs do. How do you deal with uh, trade scamming? You know, when people say, oh, trade me this. I'll give you, uh, it should cost this much gold and then they don't give you the item, for instance. It used to be a big, big part of the job. So any type of uh, harassment, scam, trade scams, uh, guilt bank scams and so on, they're all kind of similar in the sense that somebody said or promised something, uh, trade skill scams, uh, they or are just lending gold, you know, that used to be a thing in the past where you could write a ticket uh, if somebody didn't, uh, didn't fulfill his part of the deal. Like, hey, I'm gonna give you a hundred, a hundred gold, and you give it back to me in four, four weeks or whatever. But um, nowadays, those issues are not even solved anymore because you have now a better system, and that's actually a better way. Back in the day, you had to have GMs do this just to up uphold the integrity and the rules of the game. And one of the rules is like play, play nice, play fair. That's one of the Blizzard core values that you, you want to propagate, you want to share with your customer base, you want to uphold it. Um, and then you would, you would go in, you would check the, um, check the logs of what was promised, what was supposed to be delivered. Uh, and then according to the rules that were set, set out, you uphold it and then maybe hit, hit the account that was uh, doing the no-no, the bad stuff with some kind of warning or suspension, uh, depending on how often he did it. Maybe he deserved the ban if he is like a repeat offender or something. Uh, yeah. There were there were also lots more like G GDKP and trades uh, item role scams were also a big thing. But nowadays uh, you have you have better loot systems. You you. You can trade the items and uh, GM interaction is not really necessary anymore. The, the, the game improved in that regard so much that you don't need their help. But it's also for the GMs very sad because now the easy tickets for the good reputation score, they're, they're, they're gone now. So the, the easy things like restoring character, returning your mail... Um, Trade scams, harassment reports. Uh, what else is automated? Yeah, all, all, all that stuff. Trading, loot issues. Uh, couldn't loot the item. Now in retail, you get the item sent by mail if you couldn't loot it and so on. That that was a big part. Like, couldn't loot the emblems. That was a big thing in 2012. Everybody probably remembers that. I couldn't loot uh, the frost emblems from boss whatever, Syndragosa in... In in the Lich King raid, yeah, I remember all those. But now those are all automated, yeah. and it and the game is better for that, by the way. Yeah. Um. So how how do people hack accounts that are backed up with the authenticator? Oh uh, yeah, that's basically a customer support scam because it's it's just basic. Uh, it, it's just using big numbers and trying to get to cut to catch a game master off guard. So the hackers would contact the support when they already know enough information about an account. They have something like the password, uh, and if 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 you are if the hacker was really lucky, then the user would also use the same password that he used for the Blizzard account. He would also use the same password for their email account. So they have, they would have access to both so they can send the password reset to themselves. But then the only thing that would stop them is the authenticator access. So that one is a really good tool to protect yourself, be it with the physical authenticator or with the one on your phone app. 
but then the hacker still maybe <laughs> if he is like super uh, good he logs into the email and tries to sniff out the uh the personal information and and gets maybe even a real id but then otherwise he can just uh create a fake id try to contact the customer support with the uh, with the ID or the uh, fake ID, and then try to get one game master to remove the authenticator. But that, because that's just a normal system that you can you, that you can request help with. You go to the support website, and uh, there is an option. Uh, I lost my authenticator. Help me to remove it, or something like that. And if you are unlucky, the the game master just cannot discern the difference between the the ID and then he opens the account to the hacker and he already has the password or he gets a password reset on the email that he has access to and then the account gets rinsed so that's uh, the saddest thing ideally you you want game masters to double and triple check but it's so easy and I'm pretty sure even I got at some point one or two accounts just I wouldn't even know about that but yeah you have you and you have different kinds of um, you have different kinds of game masters. Some are English people, so they don't know what a German ID really looks like. You 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 need to know like really the the fine minute details. Some are like obvious fakes where you can immediately see it. But now with AIs, if AI, I would imagine it's super hard to discern. What is a real ID and what isn't? I wouldn't even know how to how to deal with that nowadays. Like you would have to send in probably <laughs> your your photo and then turn around and show yeah. up some kind of sign or something. Say bibbidi boop your character name or whatever, just to make sure that you're really the real person. Like banking systems do these now. nowadays. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you would probably have to have some kind of system like this. Just to make sure that uh, uh, the the hacker is not removing the authenticator. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's move on to our topic of uh, Blizzard drama. So. <laughs> oh, there is so much drama, drama and fruits. Oh man. Yeah. First, first question: Has anyone ever, on the inside of Blizzard, ever leaked? Um, information about a future release of any Blizzard IPs? I don't know anyone personally, but I've, I've, I've heard that there were multiple leaks happening uh, in the past. I mean, it's pretty sad, though, because it, it, at the end of the day, it just it just hurts the the industry, it hurts the, the company, and it hurts the people that are in the company. That, that that are the working people because they want to to know stuff and have access to, to cool stuff but uh, some if somebody is leaking it you just get less and less uh, sharing from the developers like uh, yeah it's really sad I mean do, do you remember when the burning crusade called classic burning crusade was um was leaked it was leaked like a day early by actual really? blizzard in a blue post <laughs> like um you know people were wondering whether it's like uh, I don't know, remember do, do, that yeah well pe pe it seems to always happen a day before and people will speculate whether Blizzard do it on purpose to like build up hype and traffic and interest or it's genuine mistakes now what would you think no I could that? totally see that happening like in, in a big organization especially once you go like super corporate like the left arm doesn't know what the right arm is doing there's just so many people working and if you have multiple levels like management, middle management, executives, then some kind of uh, in between, you get, you get all the different departments that don't know what, sh what each other department is doing. It's really easy to have a schedule and then just only one person needs to fuck up the project management. And then somebody on this side who is in community is preparing a scheduled post and he's just doing his work as he's supposed to. And then at some yeah. some other point, they say the developers say, "Oh, we need to uh, postpone the launch by one day because of this issue that we still have to fix, and the servers are not running well." And then the other guy just doesn't know about what's happening over there, and he just posts his normal schedule. I could totally see that happening. Yeah. 
Has anyone ever exploited their powers as a game master and given their personal player account any kind of benefit? Yeah, I heard rumors. I don't know, but I've heard rumors. Like, uh, they have been, uh, unfortunately, I, what, what have, wouldn't have been great if nobody was just abusing their powers in the world, but I guess humans are not designed to be like this. Some people, there's always some kind of bad apple. So, uh, there was, there was this rumor that uh, somebody was able to create items for himself um but that was like way before my time uh, i think it was in like 2006 2007 no wait 2000 2005 2006 it was like within the first 2 years or so and that they would uh would have uh lots of gold on the server nobody would know where they would come from but um you have also the counterpart and you have to have that in every every company you have to have some kind of uh internal affairs team um, that is checking on you even though <laughs> even though you are you are trusting your people you also need to have some checks and balances and then verify I mean it's uh, it's not that hard to to do spot checks and check accounts of uh, of game masters or anyone anyone working in a company and uh, seeing what they are what their access is, what what they have, where the way they got from from. So any any abuse of power would be noticed pretty fast. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't get away for long with it, even if you would get away with it for maybe a day or I don't know, a few weeks or whatever. Again. So what could you tell us about um blizzards like politically correct and woke transition within the company? So most of the stuff I only found out through there being new trainings. So anti-harassment training, anti-racism training and, and so on. That came, it, it felt like it came out of nowhere and you wouldn't know if it was from the government, if it was from uh, something that happened, if it was uh, maybe just because the company grew so large and then corporate structures where you just have the training um, the moment the company gets bigger and bigger. And you would you would only hear about the drama afterwards from the news. And you would a lot of times hear it only from the news. Like any big changes like mergers or... Um, or firing uh, people, letting go, big big changes like Mike Morheim leaving. That was the the biggest biggest one that I remember. And the the more Activision had their their power over Blizzard, the more of these like Vogue things I would I would think got introduced over time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's basically the next, the next question, you know, um, how did the Activision take over? How did that affect Blizzard over time? And like, what did you experience? Like, what kind of changes did you see from your point of view? Yeah, I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit retarded. So I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't really go and participate a lot in that drama. And, uh, I'm, I'm always focused on living my own little life. So I don't, I don't go into the the office talk and uh, uh, how do you, how do you call them the uh, office banter the ban <laughs> yeah the, the office conundrum. banter the <laughs> all, all that stuff so uh, you the thing that I noticed though is that Vivendi was was before was the biggest shareholder and it the company was owned by Vivendi but then the moment that Activision took took over you could noticeably change the uh, feel that something something has changed in the company like uh, the um, the the payouts in the share 
profit sharing were were noticeably less you you would feel systems changing changing a lot from how they used to be and change is not always uh, always bad like it can be good but it 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 feels more and more corporate it wasn't it wasn't the club or the cool thing anymore that it, how it used to be that that uh, that sense you you had the sense of family and nerdiness in in the beginning and then it got over time and get more and more the dude feeling where um you had passionate people you had artists you had uh people who really believed in the blizzard core values because you 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 were basically left alone as the blizzard company but then the more the merger the more it it was it wasn't blizzard anymore it was activision blizzard and then the further years advance it was more and more activision that's yeah, how yeah. i perceive the the feeling yeah you said a lot last night about how a lot of people were being recruited that weren't necessarily um passionate nerdy gamers there was a lot of non gamers yeah that's working. that's the feeling exactly yeah. yeah like it's it's uh, the the people that were that were playing the games those those were not the ones that i've seen re recruited and that's right. something something noticeable because not like if, in the beginning all the people that i knew they were basically playing wow well, like all of them but then this got less and less over time or yeah. even not gamers at all and then you you could notice the the shift and feeling of who you're talking to how you're talking to and it's the moment you have a culture shift usually the company feels like it's dying yeah, yeah that's true because the initial the the initial seed is just gone the initial belief the the thing that brought you together into the company that one is gone and that's also why I like to call the company Activision and not Blizzard anymore. Uh, there, there is a quote from from another developer that I really like that Blizzard is just a corpse controlled by Activision now. Yeah, that's that's what it feels in the end, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, another interesting topic is like the shift towards mobile game development. You know, what could you tell us about that? Oh. Yeah, well, that started way back, uh, way back then. So, um, from my understanding, Vivendi was a little bit in in China, and mobile gaming is is already in China. And then Activision tried to to get into the market, and they are they are all shifting towards mobile gaming. So, the you you got the biggest mobile gaming in China. You got all the world suddenly having a computer in your hand and spending so much time on it, you you got uh, a much bigger audience of, of people. It's not just the ner nerdy uh, computer geeks, but now it's everybody who can play. So there is, and there is the microtransactions, which are very lucrative. And then everything that the, that Activision does is kind of like aiming towards that. So you have the acquirement of King, the... Um, the creator of Candy Crush that came out of nowhere. That <laughs> one of those like acquisitions, like oh yeah, spent a few billion dollars to to, to get the developer, and then uh, suddenly there were uh, mobile games like Hearthstone, and then ultimately, don't you have phones, uh, Diablo? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And all this on the back of the Chinese market, which is like huge with mobile phones because their demographic is so uh, so poor in general that they don't own any... Uh, that's from my understanding. Maybe I'm wrong, don't quote me on that. But my understanding is that, that they are poor. They cannot own any high fidelity tech or at least like 10 years ago or something. But they all could could own a phone that was capable of providing some entertainment and which which is like then the big market that you can uh address which you which you can tap into 
Yeah, I mean, actually, even even here, like, you know, in the West, I mean, a decent gaming PC is going to set you back a grand, but everyone already has a phone, so it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Even though they are the same, uh, we're the same price, right? I mean, a phone easily goes up to a grand as well. Oh, yeah, like, sometimes. you get one of the shiny ones, yeah. Even even the low low ones, uh, if you go for like two four hundred bucks, is already a lot as well for for the average uh, user. Yeah, I think, I think the saddest thing. But about it can this, do this so game. much more. Sorry, yeah. but it can just Sorry. do so much more. It's so it's so uh, versatile that it's a better investment than getting a PC that you only use at home and that you only use for leisure activities. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the sad things about this is people have the belief that, oh, Blizzard are making loads and loads of money from all these mobile games. Oh, that will mean in turn that World of Warcraft will have more profit uh, spent on it to make it a better game. But obviously we know that that's just, uh, <laughs> as time is going on, the game is just getting you know worse and worse. I I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> yeah, no. I th I think I think everything is already set in stone, and it's World of Warcraft, and the consumer base is just being farmed. Like we used to have conventions for thousands of people. I mean, yeah, the the virus uh, interjected with that one a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah, like, so there is not a lot that, uh, being spent on the Poland. community. To yeah. Talk about that convention in Poland. <laughs> That's a funny story. Oh yeah, well that one that one is a sad one actually. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> it's, uh, like the, every, every time you have a convention somewhere, and then especially in Poland, if half of the stuff is being stolen, and then you 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 just have negatives from the convention, you just stop doing the conventions. Yeah, yeah. that's that's a little bit sad. But but also for the for the community, like there is less and less effort being put into it because it's already running it's there is there is not enough incentive to to gain because the peak already happened in 2012 right with the lich yeah. king so now it's uh it's a game on the decline and that's the the sad part that uh that doesn't seem to be a lot of effort put into it anymore even though classic really revived it like it it felt like at least 10 times uh yeah, yeah. Uh, more active with, with how many players came back. Well, yeah, could just imagine like we had twelve million playing at the peak, and then a big chunk came back just to 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 relive the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, what can you tell us about these like big firing waves of Blizzard? Um, you know, m multiple have happened over the past few years, haven't they? And then obviously, you've been victim of that as well. You know, what else could you mm. tell us about that? Yeah, the first one I hear, heard about, I don't, re I don't really actually know why that happened. But there is, there was, the first one that I heard about was the uh, Blizzard 500. There were like 500 GMs uh, in Austin, I believe, that were, that were let go. That was a big thing back then. And um, I heard rumors that just one day you come into the office and then uh, half of you go in that room, half of you go in the other room, and then, yeah, you're fired, you get to stay. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, t like, a few were uh, developers as well, but most most was the EGM stuff. And that that's really sad, because it's, it's just a numbers game at this point, because each individual, even if you pay minimum wage, each GM is saving so much money on the back end for the company. And it's something where you can cut the quality of, of your support staff and just remove it from your balance sheet. That's, that's the sad part. Yeah. Yeah. And then the same for cutting a whole, um, a whole office. Um, I don't really know why it happened. I mean, the, the original reason given is like economical struggle, but then also in 2019, Activision Blizzard had the, the highest uh, earnings year ever or something. Mm. And then just shortly after, people were fired. And it's like, eh. A lot of shenanigans going on with uh, 
with high payouts for the the upper management. I think that's a societal issue, though. I don't think it's just Activision uh, that is uh, faulty of that. It's uh, it's more like product. If you ever seen that productivity going up, uh, but then the um, the pay of the average person is just stagnating. Yeah, yeah. And so the the average the average uh, pe- person is just not being paid out to what they should have. I remember m- my my payment increase was actually really good in general because I always had uh, good scores, good uh, um, good tickets per house and so on. So it was like between two to four point five percent, but that's barely fighting inflation, you know. Some now you 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 have inflation of like seven eight ten percent sometimes, um, if you think about it. Even though the like real number that they quote is much lower, but you're you're not earning any purchasing power. No. Yeah, that's sad. So yeah, to clarify, um, basically like as a GM, you get like a as I understand it, you get like a score based on how many tickets you respond to per hour, and then you get rated on um you know, the feedback sheets. Uh, and that can determine, did you say like a zero to 4% pay payment increase, pay, pay rise increase annually? I don't know how it is everywhere. I mean, uh, maybe it's actually, there is maybe even a minimum in in Europe. I don't remember that, how, how that works specifically. I just know that my, uh, my lowest one was 1.5% at some point, the, the mm-hmm. yearly increase, yeah. Uh, did you stay? But that's in not t- a lot. That's like almost nothing. Yeah. Did you stay in touch with people from um, your office in France? Yeah, people. People are really well connected uh, on on Facebook. There is the the. I know the. Uh, I don't know if it still existed, but I heard that the old people that got fired, like in two thousand twelve, two thousand. I think it was two thousand twelve. Yeah, two thousand twelve. The Blizzard five hundred. They have a Facebook group going. There is discords, there is uh, Facebook connections. Uh, People are still talking and banding together and having some connections. I mean, some people even get married, right? So game game masters that got together and made families. Um, It was really a a big family in the beginning. People were sitting next to each other each day. Uh, uh, Kind of was like a classroom feeling. You know, you get put, put into a room. It was really, really nice. Um, some fights, some people hated each other, uh, some people were drinking in bars, uh, some people got married, like you, you had all kinds of relationships coming out from that, be it friendly. Most of them are friendly, yeah, and amicus. Yeah, um, you, you told me an interesting story last night about, um, you know, we're, we're talking about China and how you can no longer, uh, you know, play World of Warcraft in China. Um, you were telling me about like how someone got, went to visit the game master team um, in China. Uh, so you know, what, what could you tell us about that? Yeah, China is a weird land. <laughs> they all they all tick different. They they all deal with things different over there. So uh, they they have this face saving kind of deal going on there which is a cultural culturally completely different and if they if they want to achieve something they just make it happen but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna take the road of the core values that you set out in the beginning so for example if you want to have really good customer support ex- customer support numbers uh, and you have, I don't know, like a thousand tickets in the queue and you manage to do 500 during the day, you just delete all the other 500 and then the next tickets on the next day are great again. So you, because you, you work through all of them, but that's just, you know, it's the mentality shift of that, of just deleting any tickets that, that came in. It's just unthinkable in, in the Western, uh, in the Western part. Yeah. Yeah. Really sad that they all lost the access to the game. Uh, yeah, it is. Now good. they have now they have a copycat, a bootleg World of Warcraft. Yeah. yeah. Probably um, a lot of revenue also lost for for Activision. 
So it's yeah. a lot of players that, that are gone, lots of subscriptions. So that also negatively probably affects uh, the the bottom for everything. Because now, now the restriction on how profitable WoW is, now the margin is smaller. Now you can do less stuff with it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, time to move on to this uh, the section of burning questions. So right now in the game, it takes a very, very long time to uh, get a ticket response from a GM for normally like a uh, fairly basic stuff. Um, you know, what, why, why do you think that is and why, why is it slower now compared to the past? Mm -hmm. It always depends on the time frame because you, you do have lull times when there is... So you, you have not a lot of tickets uh, when there is no bugs in the game, when there is no uh, looming issues, when there is no uh, big things happening in the game like raid releases or whatnot because then you got an automated increase in harassment, you get an automatic increase in loot issues, you get an automated uh, automating increase in like scams and so on. So yeah. all all these drive ticket requests. So the moment something has happened, like a patch or something, you also get an increase in ticket counts. Um, but... Uh, there, there are also things that are outside of that. There, if you are not working fast enough to remove the tickets, they also just accumulate even more and even more and even more. And then, if you don't have enough GMs, you cannot work through through all of them. And yeah, I mean, I I think that's one of the big issues that there's just less less GMs now. I mean, how many were fired? Like 600, 800 people or so were fired. So, and total was probably around 2,000, maybe 2,500, if at all. Wow. So now half your, half your, you, half your customer support is fired. Um, I heard there was some, some like temporary staff hired on or something like that. And then Quark still exists and the workload could be shared with, one of the other regions like us could try to deal with with the onslaught but i guess it's just not enough and then you also have the giant spike from world of warcraft classic and i'm thinking that all the all, all the people that came into classic that they still have the memory of what the old gms the the old blizzard was helping with how the old system worked and I'm thinking they would create tickets and create requests based on that. Yeah, but it's just an assumption. I, I mean, yeah, I don't even know what what now everything is possible with AI. It's probably a decent chunk is just uh, being answered with AI and just mass replied by a computer or something. Um, yeah, it definitely. It's kind of actually weird that there is still a high queue, even though. Uh, even though you now have better tools, better access, less less issues, better um, better systems in the game that should reduce all that workload for for everybody. That's weird. a lot that, less people playing now as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, a lot less people playing now, and there's much more automated systems that require. So mm -hmm. so now like it's less hands on uh, individual GM uh, responses needed. But yet, the wait times maybe, are longer. Maybe now. there is more people reporting bots <laughs> to <doing> manual <laughs> tickets. Like, hey, I found a bot here. <laughs> how how much does reporting a bot actually help? Uh I guess it depends on if the GM has time or is allowed to deal with the bot. Mm. Like, if if there is no time to to deal with requests, or if if they are told to escalate the ticket or just collect it or drop it away, then. I uh, know. Depends. I wouldn't know how they are going to be handled with nowadays. Yeah. Um, do people get IP banned when they, you know, do get banned? Uh, is it an IP ban? Oh, that would be very difficult for World of Warcraft. So no, uh, because you have people with this. Uh, actually, you can even get around it real quick, quickly. But just uh, in Europe, you don't even have uh, IP. Do you have them in UK? Do you well, have I one IP? IP? 
IP addresses, yeah. I think they roam yeah. though, they change. Yeah, in 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 Europe in most of Europe you don't have a set IP, so it doesn't do jack shit anyway. Yeah, it's I think it's only an American and UK thing. And then um there are some older systems. Um like I I've had stories about um people from dorm rooms that share a connection for like Diablo 2 and then they can't play anymore because one of the guy next next to them in in the next uh, dorm room was cheating or something mm-hmm. so then <laughs> then the other guy can can't play uh just because of that and having something like that on a subscription based system in World of Warcraft would be really detrimental to the to the player base yeah. yeah i don't i don't think that that's going to be useful or fly no. So, do game masters get their own unique World of Warcraft client, and you know how is that set up? Well, that's just a security feature. I mean, you you can't you can't really connect or do anything with the normal client. It's just just how it goes. Um, it would be a security risk if you would be able to do everything with your normal game client. There are, there are multiple clients. There are the test clients, there are the GM clients, there are the, uh, the normal clients, there's developer clients, and so on. Yeah, you have, you have different different kinds of games. Um, what do you think about like GDKPs? Do you think, do you think Blizzard could ban or prevent oh, people from doing sketch. GDKPs? <sighs> Yeah, I don't. I don't really know how you would deal with that. Like that's such a hard question. Uh, GD, GDKPs, they're they're basically a gold laundering system, and they're part of the big inflation issue. Because yeah. even even while bots create all all the gold, uh, ultimately. Ultimately, it's the users that are creating the issue because they're buying the gold. And the G- GDKP is is just an occurrence based on the fact that people are buying gold. If people weren't buying gold and they were disincentivized to buy bold, gold, then you also wouldn't have the GK- GDKP system as you have them now with like thousands and millions of gold being thrown mm-hmm. around. Because they are basically just, um, just resellers, and they're they're dealing with the gold in a way that is negatively impacting, um, and and circumventing the normal game mechanics. Because you're not supposed to be able to buy your way into digital things yeah. in World of Warcraft. Like the original idea was, you are you have this world that is completely separate from the real world and you can be and do whatever whatever you you want to be in this locked off environment but now with the with the gold sellers and with the hackers and with um with the gdkps you're introducing this this side hustle, this this uh, cheat code that's coming in from outside. Yeah, yeah it doesn't put everyone, everyone on an even playing field. Um, no, and this is this is part of the like integrity, um, integrity choice. If if you as a developer want to to make sure that your game is running in a certain way, you have to put effort into it. And then how much effort you put into it shows how much you value it. Uh, But also I have to say that one part of the equation is the user base, because the user base had the chance back in the past to give signals to Activision or even to Blizzard when, when when they had full autonomy to stop all the nonsense. They... Like, if the user base really wanted to get rid of bots, they could have stopped paying their subscription. If everybody banded together and said, "This is bullshit. I don't want the. I don't want thirty out of forty uh, people be bots in Alterac. 
I don't want to see farming bots running around in the world. I don't want to to see uh, all the farming and flying and hacking bots in the instances like Zulgroup, Maraudon, and um, Botanica and so on. If they really wanted that, they could have just stopped paying bl their Blizzard subscription for one month. And that would have cost millions in revenue for the company. And then you could enact change and say, okay, I'm coming back to the game if you fix the issues. Or I at least have a plan to fix the issues. If there was something like that from the player base, then you would have been able to enact some change. Because if, if, you, want to, if you want to have the result, you also need to give up something. Yeah, but it's really hard to to focus like millions of people, especially at the at the height, like twelve million people. How can you focus them to all give up something for a day or so if they are if they are just using it as an escape and they don't really even see the all the issues in the background because all the gold, all the hacking, all the botting and so on, it's creating this slight inflation, just like in real life with, with uh, the banking and the government printing money. You only see like a slow rise in the back. But if you look at it over the span of 10 years, you see, oh, everything is just now super expensive. And the same happens with the gold and all the, all the, all the um, items in, in World of Warcraft. It's just a slow death over time. Yeah, just because it, you couldn't see that in in 2012 and you couldn't stop to play the game for one month. Like, I, I promise you, if 60% of the user base uh, just stopped playing for one month and said, you need to address the bot issues, I'm pretty sure the developers would have fixed it. Like, that would have been priority number one. Yeah, the problem is people are just too addicted, can't stop playing. <laughs> That's the problem. Um... So, yeah. what, but it also what, shouldn't necessarily on. be on them, right? I mean, ideally, you have enough integrity as a developer to say, "Yeah, I want my game to be the best." You know, I want to be the very best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what is the purpose of GM Island? What's that all about? Oh, that's really boring. I just log in. GM Island doesn't even exist anymore. Like it, you, it just used to be the lock in. Uh, where your character would would first appear, and that's it. It's like that's it. there's nothing going on there. Yeah, yeah. the chair there's, wasn't there's, used for anything in that room. No, nah, no. Nah. There is there is this room under under the island. Yeah, but if if it ever was used, uh, it was never used while I while I was there. So it, it seems more like a gimmick, or somebody thought it might have been a good idea, but it, I I don't think it was ever used for anything. It wasn't wasn't actually implemented. Yeah. I think. Like when you see footage of it actually being used on YouTube and stuff, it's I think it's private servers that are actually uh, using it. Um, oh, so so they have a use after all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not how they envisioned it. I mean, it's 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 really silly. Why why would you want to teleport someone onto DGM Island? Really, like you you could summon summon them anywhere in the world and have the same effect. Just outside of of a city or whatever, you could. You could summon someone into a complete dead space where no players are running around. You don't. It doesn't need to be like a special room, or it can be any other house. Yeah. yeah. So, what are the limitations on your personal account when you are a game master? Uh, don't misbehave. Don't tell anybody that you're a GM. That one's a weird one. Yeah, like oh, pretty obvious one. Yeah. Yeah, I never understood that rule. It's kind of weird. Doesn't make sense. I mean, I okay, wait. It makes sense you're, the, that you're not gonna run around in game and tell everybody like, "Hey, I'm a GM. I'm a GM. I can do whatever you want." Because then it creates this dynamic of you insert, uh, exerting power over the other individual, and you're sub like again. This goes probably. This goes back to the original integrity of the game where. You are you are not supposed to be different in the game. Everybody's supposed to be on equal level in the game. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as a as a GM, you you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't use your power just like you wouldn't use it on social media, or you wouldn't say that 
I don't know, I work for Activision, please give me goodies or uh, please uh, bring me on your show or something. And then you also wouldn't be representing, <laughs> you would be representing uh, the company, you you would be just your own voice. Yeah. Um, perhaps you could explain to us why Game Masters always have such weird names. Uh, that's... That's just... There's something flying around here. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> um, that's more like a database thing. Like, you you need to your name to be unique because uh, basically you're creating your character on all realms and it's, it can't be anything that's stupidly... Uh, stupidly already taken. So if if you call yourself Michael as a GM, then Michael is already taken on so many realms and you could be faked and so on. So it has to be something super unique, uh, can't be searched on Google or um, has no connotations. Like it, it cannot be something that's uh, sexual or has a reference in Wikipedia or something like that. Something something that you could misunderstand in a different language because then it, it would create an issue if you talk to a customer and then some or somebody sees your GM name in a forum or something and then it's some kind of insult in a specific language like that would create issues. Yeah. Like uh, uh, you, you wouldn't call yourself uh, Dusuka or something as a GM. <laughs> I'm not going to ask what that means. Uh, I'm just going to bleep it out in the edit. So what can you tell us about uh, server structure, server size? Um, you know, how do servers work? People are always asking questions about how servers work. Oh. Well, uh, the, uh, what, what exactly? Because it's, it's more well, like I'm, I'm not an engineer, but... Like the capacity of servers and uh, like mass servers, a lot of people have a lot of theories about them. Oh well, the the original servers they were like five hundred people or so. They were super small. I heard that they were only designed for even three hundred or so people in the beginning. They were super tiny, but that was the limitation of the time back then. And then with the um, server technology being improved, they increased, and I think it went up to like two thousand, three thousand players. Uh, that could be online at the same time. And then you got the uh, sharding introduced and the phasing introduced, where uh, you basically can now expand the server limitless and have different instances of the same world. Yeah. Um, and then you have like 15,000, 20,000 people and so on, especially on, on Classic, that makes a lot of sense. And then mo most people know this, though, um, because if you in classic, if you try to get Onyxia, Onyxia's hat to to get to drop for the buff, only then one of the layers would get them, and not the other one where there's like another I don't know five thousand players or so sitting in layer two, and then layer one, um, the phasing only has the the other three, four, five thousand players or so on, and then only those get get the buff. Yeah, but it's just a scaling solution. One sec. We can do more after. We can do unboxing, showcasing all the cool Blizzard gifts. We can do reminiscence. There's so many things. Yeah, yeah. Um, that might be interesting. So, how how long do game logs last for? Ah, oh, that's easy to deduce. You can you can just see how long your items are in the item restoration. Like, if there there are a few a few things in in World of Warcraft, where you can get support for them. And you go to the item rest automated item restoration, you go to the mail restoration or the mail forward, and then it's roughly like two to three months, depending on the item. Um, like green items some, uh, sometimes get deleted after like uh, two, three weeks or so, and you cannot restore them anymore. But like the the uh, the high... Higher, more important items like epics, they stay for up to three months or so. Right. Um, 
So, I mean, we're, we're basically coming to the end now. Um, here's a question. What, what stuff have you seen um, inside Blizzard that hasn't actually been developed? Uh, can't even remember a lot of this stuff. I mean, I've probably seen more. Um, the, the one that stands out the most, because that one wasn't released, was Titan. So, um... That it's that is so sad because the 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 setup and the the work the the artwork the um the cinematics the the groundwork that was putting into that one that was so amazing like uh, I've never seen anything like that and the the ideas uh, or the the visuals I would I would say they they were really amazing to see. I want. I wonder. I don't even know why. Why it was never gotten out. I can only. I, I can only. Well, it's, it's like sci-fi, but I. Yeah. I can only. Because that's ultimately what Overwatch came out. It's like, like the 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 sci-fi feeling and look of of Overwatch, but it's. Um, we never got an explanation of why it stopped or why why it was. Uh, discontinued and then just morphed into into overwatch yeah um i i could only like my personal assumption i don't know if, if it's true or not but destiny was coming out at, at the same time and it's very similar to to overwatch so maybe that had something to do because that's that's kind of the same the same universe or feeling kind of and then they they would fight each other maybe that was the reason um maybe mmos are just dying out because there, there hasn't been uh big mmos uh released or any big big projects like most of the games um like big worlds you know yeah, yeah. Um, most of the games are like small in comparison to to World of Warcraft or anything of like a grand design, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a weird one. Did Blizzard ever plan to make the Ashbringer, not the corrupted Ashbringer, but the original Ashbringer, uh, obtainable by players? Yeah, so there there are only rumors, but I mean that's probably something better to ask a developer like Kevin Jordan or Jason, what is it, Jason Stead or something, who's doing the the WoW diary, diary yeah, yeah. book, and Kevin Jordan might actually know what really happened to the uh, Ashbringer because he was part of the development and so on, but GMs wouldn't know about this. I only know things that were figured out by players and like there, there was this whole ang angling um angling angle <laughs> where people thought that you could fish up the ashbringer because of some reference from Ned Pagel's uh, fisherman book or something and there were like two or three items that were kind of put into game in patches that were alluding to or were giving hints to the ashbringer but then it never actually was implemented yeah yeah what what can you tell us about the origin of like certain game master items there's a lot there's loads of game master items in the game like Frostmorn, there's um Fiora's fire resistance uh bags, like the 36 slot bags. There's even a mount that basically is the same model of um Ashes of Alar. Like, do you know anything about the other weirder GM items? I don't even know about <laughs> any mount. What? That's news to me. Really? Is that I, a real I'm GM sure. item? Yeah, everything was called Fiora. Fiora, I think that's a surname of an old developer yeah, or something. Fiora was one of the developers. I, yeah. I would think that most of the items that had, uh, they were done for probably QA or testing. Yeah. But uh, as, a, as a GM, you wouldn't need to use um, any items. Yeah. So, yeah, so they're probably technically just, not you, GM yeah. items, are they? They're just but developer testing yeah. items. QA, developer, testing, some sort, yeah. Do you know anything about like the the robes that a GM wears? Like, why 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 is is that just? It just is what it is. Those are just cool. Just cool. Yeah, well, those are just cool. Uh, because yeah. uh, those make you unique, and 
nobody else can have them. There are some robes that have like very similar color scheme, but not quite the GM color. It's it's the special Blizzard Blue style, and nobody else can get them. So if you are seen and you are visible to players in in game for whatever reason, then you you are discernible from everybody else and you can you can sometimes see the gms pop up in like some of the videos when they show themselves to to the raids or um when on the P, on the ptrs most of the times on the test test realms you you got some developers hanging out and then they are in gm ropes as well yeah uh, sometimes it's also community well, isn't yeah sometimes it's also community managers yeah they just oh. just wear the the gm colors yeah um, it's like what is it? Uh, feet, rope, and the hat or something. Yeah, I if I remember so. correctly, or was it? Or was it just the rope and the f and the feet? Probably just the rope and the feet. Yeah, because it's like you a, can, you can make a really cool um, set out of the GM ropes and then some of the next Rammers cloth items because they are similar in color fashion. So you could have like the cool next Rammers uh, crafted shoulders. And then the GM ropes and some other items that would make you look really cool. Yeah. Uh, but if nobody can see you, then why go through the trouble? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a buff, isn't there, that makes you not visible to players. That yeah. you click on yourself. Well, it's it's constantly on anyway. You know, like nobody, nobody's no, nobody nobody is seeing GMs. No, you 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 can you can turn it off. It's just a just a normal spell, yeah. but. Uh, it's like you're you're not supposed to be seen because the world is not supposed to be breaking the immersion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You you would only do it if you really have an in-game reason to do so for for interacting with an NPC or a script of some kind that that really needs you for the NPC to see you or something like that. Right. But those are rare and far between. Yeah. So, there anything else you wanna wanna talk about for like things you know things you wanna get off your chest that we haven't covered? Anything I've missed? I don't know. There are probably lots of small, cool things that I can't think of in the moment, but I don't know. I mean, if I can, you were, I can only. Oh. Hmm? I I I can only be as uh, entertaining uh, as. As good in entertainment as the questions are. Right. I mean, if you were totally in control of Blizzard's like game master team, analyst team, uh, and everything like that, you know, what what would you what would you do to make it better? I would probably set it up differently in terms of of access, and I would allow more sovereignty i would i would set it up in a more decentralized way where everybody has the agency and everybody is so well trained that they are basically like a terminator that have mm -hmm. no remorse they they just do their job and they're really good at it like in instead Instead of focusing on metrics, it would be more beneficial if people were actually doing good work and were having fun at it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the the corporate structures, they are just they're just so much overhead and they, I think they're focusing towards the wrong goals. So if you're constantly aiming at doing a certain amount of tickets, answering in a certain way, fearing that you get fired because the customer rated you badly because of your interaction or something, and you're doing then a worse job for the game because of some metrics just to keep your job. It always puts you in like a fearful state. So mm -hmm. you're, you're, not, you're not your best person at, at this point in time. And if you have more agency, if you get more trust from the company, if you are set up in a in a freedom environment, in an abundance mentality, then you can actually do good work. 
And it, it also helps if your pay is better and you're not on uh, on minimum wage. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that would help. But even so, I mean, Blizzard always has been, even, even way back in the day, you were basically hired for your passion and for the reputation that Blizzard has had. And Activision is kind of still living on this, but it's not... It doesn't seem... I hear so many voices that say, yeah, it used to be my dream job, but it's... I don't want to work there anymore or I looked into it and then I decided not to work there anymore. I hear more and more of those voices where from early 2000s to probably like 2012 it's or so, everybody wanted to be in Blizzard development, working at Blizzard, being in the community... Uh, being an engineer or something just for the fun of it just because it was such such a good reputation for, of of the company yeah yeah and now that's that seems lost unfortunately i don't know if it's i i really wish that it can come back from that yeah, yeah i think a lot of the community um have theorized and suspected that you know everything that you've just said here is the case so um, I've definitely taken up uh, enough of your time, which I'm very uh, appreciative of. Um, you have a, a YouTube channel, right? Uh, where you yeah, but special- a tiny one, super tiny, tiny one. Tiny one. You specialize now <laughs> yeah. in yeah, I moved to- crypto security. Have I got that right? Yeah, I'm basically That's- doing the same shit I've done before as well. It's, uh, it's mm-hmm. like uh, customer support. It's technical support. It's uh, community management and... It's just helping other people, but just not in games anymore, but in the crypto world. So I'm and I'm running this little um, Etsy shop where I sell crypto security seed backups. So yeah. if you, you want you to can learn, show them, if you want, if you've got them, uh, yeah, sure. I, I'll give you I'll give you some photos to put up All on right. the screen. All right. <laughs> uh, you can pop up the website. So I am. Just minding my own business, have my little shop, um, doing doing some work on the side and uh, enjoying Portugal. Yeah, yeah, yeah I bet. So check check it out if you if you ever need some kind of coaching training, hit me up. Check out my YouTube channel. Check me out on Twitter, Instagram. It's all BPK das Baum and baumcrypto.etsy.com. Yeah. Thank you for hey. having me, by the way. Yeah. No, that's all right. Um, Everything will be in the description, guys. Um, and I think we're going to end the video there. So, uh, my name is Meta Goblin. Um, what, what you can say, what your name is. <laughs> yeah, you can call me BPK Das Baum because that's all my socials. Yeah. Right. You got to say ciao now. Ciao. 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 Right. <laughs> <laughs>